I want to label the message today, Three Pictures of the Church. Three Pictures of the Church. What is the church? This is one of three foundational questions the New Testament answers. The first is, who is Jesus? The second is, what is the gospel? And the third is the question of our text, what is the church? In a real sense, these questions are interwoven. To answer one is to address all three. But the church is clearly the focus of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. It is one of the most significant statements in Scripture about the nature, purpose, and unity of the church. You can easily miss the significance of this passage if you don't pay careful and close attention. The New Testament typically talks about the church in word pictures. It does not give a formal definition of the church. It rather gives multiple descriptions of the church, and this is how Paul talks about the nature of the church in these closing verses of Ephesians chapter 2. It begins with us being dead in trespasses and sins, but it ends with us being united in Christ to God and to one another. This is an important passage about the nature, about the unity, and about the purpose of the church that we desperately need to hear today. The author, Henry Nouwen, once told of his days as a chaplain on a cruise ship. Going on a Dutch ship, they landed or found themselves in fog headed to Rotterdam. From the bridge, the steersmen could not even see the bow of the ship. And the captain paced back and forth frantically, listening to the radio for coordinates coordinates for where they were so they would not run into other ships. But as he paced back and forth, he ran into Chaplain Nowen. Nowen said the captain cursed him and sent him away. But as he began to flee, the captain said, wait a minute, stay around. This may be the only time I really need you. Now and then went on to reflect how this really is the attitude many people have toward the church. The church is not necessary when there is smooth sailing, but we keep it around just in case it might be of help when the storms of life are raging. This is how many people in the world and the culture we live in view the church. And unfortunately, this is the way many professing Christians view the church. My daddy used to extend the invitation to discipleship when I was a boy. He would just simply say that if going to church is right, being in church is right, then being out of church must be wrong. And with that simple statement, people would come and join the church. But we no longer live in a day where there is that assumption that being in church is right. Even Christians think that you can love Jesus and hate the church. Paul makes it clear here, to be in Christ is to be in the church. And he makes that point through three word pictures. Let me give them to you as quickly as I can. First, Paul says that we are Citizens in God's kingdom. 
We are citizens in God's kingdom. Look at verse number 19. In fact, in this chapter as a whole, you'll note that Paul leads his readers forward in faith in Christ by calling them to remember what they were without Christ. Verse 1, and you were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 12, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, in verse 19, he says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. There are actually two word pictures in verse 19. The first is a political image. It affirms the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the present but not yet rule of God over the earth. And those who trust in the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ are a part of the in-breaking kingdom of God. Paul declares this wonderful truth by way of a stark contrast. He first says, again, remember what you were. You were aliens and strangers. The word aliens speaks of One who lives in a foreign land speaking a different language with allegiance to another government. Strangers refers to those who may live in a land but do not have the privileges of citizenship. Paul says this is our status without Jesus Christ. We are both aliens and strangers. But in Christ, he says, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Think about that. In Christ, you become a citizen of God's kingdom. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says, for our citizenship is in heaven. Christ does not merely make us members of the nation of Israel. He has made us citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We are citizens, he says. That means we have rights and responsibilities before God. But he doesn't just say We are citizens. Look at the whole phrase in verse 19. We are fellow citizens with the saints. Fellow citizens. Citizens means we have rights before God, but fellow citizens means we have relationship with one another. On the seal of the United States of America is the Latin phrase in pluribus unum. Out of the many, one. That's the ideal for the United States that we very rarely live up to. But in a greater, higher, deeper way, this is the truth of all who are in Christ Jesus. We are citizens of God's kingdom. Picture number two. Not only are we citizens of God's kingdom, but Paul says we are also members of God's household. Listen to verse 19 again. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Think about that. It's one thing to be a citizen of the kingdom. It's another thing to be a child of the king. This is what Paul is declaring when he says we are members of God's household. God is our Father in Christ Jesus. Matthew 6 and 9, he says to his disciples, when you pray, you ain't got to pray Jehovah this, Jehovah that. Memorizing Old Testament names for God, you can just go to God and say, Our Father. 
in heaven. In fact, this is what Paul does in chapter 3, verse 14. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. In Christ, we have the privilege of approaching the God of heaven like a trusting child coming to a loving father. God is our father in Christ. How does he become our father? He's, he's not the father of everybody. Because in John 8, verse 44, Jesus says to some unbelievers, you like your father, the devil, who was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Not every human being is a child of God. What does it mean to become God's child? You become God's child two ways. You become God's child by birth. In John 3, <laughs> a religious man thought he could get into the kingdom by his resume of accomplishments, but Jesus says, do not be surprised about what I'm about to tell you. You must be born again. And in John chapter 1, verse 12, Jesus says, John tells us, for as many as received him, as many as believed on his name, gave he the right to become the children of God who are born not of blood, not the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. We become God's children by birth, and we become God's children by adoption. Look at chapter 1, verse 5 of Ephesians. Paul says, let me tell you how you became God's child. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Christ Jesus according to to the purpose of his will. You mean, Pastor, you believe in predestination? It's in the Bible, ain't it? I sure do believe it. I believe God didn't get, wait till we got here to figure out whether or not he was going to save us. That word predestined means to predetermine. When did he predetermine? I'm convinced by the scripture that he predetermined to save us sometime before Genesis 1 and 1. Before God ever said, let there be light, he had you on his mind. And he chose to adopt you, not because you were so good or so special or so wonderful, but he adopted us through Christ Jesus. He did it according to the purpose of his will. He adopted us through Christ Jesus. Listen to me, friends. Calvary is heaven's adoption agency. And if you run to the cross and trust in the blood of Jesus, God will not just forgive your sins, but he will adopt you into his family. So this second picture, are you glad about that? Good. But here comes the bad part for some of us. This second picture not only means that we are the children of God in Christ, but it also means that if we are God's children, we are brothers and sisters. You, you're not God's only child. L listen to the language. We are members of God's household. When my first child was born, HB, became almost two months premature. I was in Atlanta. My wife took ill. They rushed her to the hospital. I made my way back home on the first thing smoking and rushed to the hospital to check on my wife and to see my son. He was under four pounds at birth, weak, tubes everywhere, but he was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. 
because he was mine. But we hung out at that hospital waiting for him to get strong enough so we can take him home. It wasn't our goal. Thank God for everything the hospital did to bring him into the world. But it wasn't our intention for him to stay in the hospital. We, we were going to take him home. And this is God's plan for every one of his children. He, he, he's grateful that you are his, but as his, he wants to take care of you. And the means by which he takes care of you is by you being a part of a household called the church. Listen to me. God does not want his children living in the streets. You are not that spiritually mature that you don't need the church. If God is your father, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and God expects you to be a part of the household of faith. What does it mean for us to be the church? <laughs> it means we are citizens of God's kingdom. It means we are members of God's household. Lastly, it means we are living stones in God's temple. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, there are two images for the church, a kingdom and a building. But in verses 20 through 26, in the middle of the sentence, there is a third image. It is the image of a building, the image of a building. Listen to me. This building is not the church. Back when I was a boy, they used to call it this building, they used to call it the church house to indicate that the building is not the church. It's just the place where the church meets. This building is not the church. The church is a building. We, the people of God in Christ, are a building, and not just any building. We are are a temple, God's temple, and every member is a living stone in God's temple. Look at how Paul fleshes that out. He first says in verse 20 that this building is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The apostles were sent out by Jesus Christ to Continue his work, proclaim his message, and establish his church after his resurrection and ascension to the Father on high. Paul himself was a commissioned apostle of Jesus Christ. The prophets are New Testament prophets here who supported the ministry of the apostles. This is why prophets here is mentioned after apostles as it is in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 6 and chapter 4 verse 11. He says, together, these apostles and prophets are the foundation of the building. But he is not suggesting that the prophets and apostles themselves are the foundation. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11, Paul says that no one can lay any foundation besides what's already been laid, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the foundation of the church. The apostles... And the prophets are not themselves the foundation, but the ministry of the apostles and the prophets is the foundation. The apostles declared, the prophets confirmed the person and work of Jesus Christ, and this Christ-centered message is the foundation of the church. And in this sense, the apostles and the prophets are the foundation of the church because their message became the foundational library of the church called the New Testament. They 
by their preaching and teaching, laid the foundation for the church. Therefore, listen, we don't need any apostles today. We don't need any prophets. How many times do you lay the foundation of a building? Only once. And the foundation of the church has already been laid. The, the, the authority of the apostles is already established. The revelation given to the prophets is already complete. We don't need no more revelation from prophets. My Bible got 66 books in it, and the last book is called Revelation. And it tells you how the story is going to end. What more revelation do you need than that? Listen to me. Anyone who claims the divine authority of the New Testament apostles or the divine revelation of the New Testament prophets is out of order, and the church should shun him or her as frauds. You ain't got to clap. You ain't got to say amen. I'm, I can stand by myself on that. We got too many title-hungry preachers in the church. Bishop ain't enough. Now we got prophets and apostles. We're going to have messiahs in the pulpit in a minute if you ain't careful. We don't need more titles. We just need faithful shepherds who will give their life to building on the foundation of the word that's already been laid. The apostles and the prophets are the foundation, says the text. And to make it clear that it is not themselves that are the foundation. He adds this, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. In our day, listen, <laughs> what happens is you take a, you build and you build up the building, and after the building is complete, you put a memorial plaque or something in the wall, and you call that the cornerstone. But that's just the opposite in ancient masonry. In ancient masonry, the cornerstone was the first stone that was cut. And it was placed strategically on the land because this cornerstone would have to bear the weight of the rest of the building. And every other stone would be cut to line up with the dimensions of the cornerstone. And the other stones would simply be built on top of the cornerstone. I wish y'all wouldn't make me work so hard on it. Do you get the point he's making? He is saying that the weight of the church rests on not the preacher, not the deacons, not the choir, not the membership. The weight of the church rests on Jesus. And if the church is going to be in order, everything else has got to be lined up with Jesus. And if the church is going to grow, you've got to build everything on Jesus. He is the cornerstone. Without him, the church cannot be built. Take him away, and the building will come tumbling down. He is the cornerstone of the church. And so that means in practical terms that in him, verse 21, the whole structure being joined together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. God has joined us together in Christ. The church is not meant to be separate stones laying about. We're to be built together. And built together in Christ, we are to be growing. The church ought to always be growing. But this is not about statistics. The concern here is not so much numerical growth, but spiritual growth. We're to grow, look at the end of verse 21, into a holy temple 
in the Lord. Temple is a meeting place between God and man. And God has made Christ the cornerstone and given us the foundation of Scripture so that the church might be the place where people find God. But listen to what he's saying. Because of Jesus, the Old Testament temple has become the New Testament church. God's meeting place is not a place, it's people. And so we, if, if we're going to point people to God, you got to be a holy temple. You can't, you can't live like the world and point people to Jesus. If, if God's white sheep become dingy gray, all black sheep will feel more comfortable. You got to be a holy temple in the Lord to point people to God. And the Bible says, in him you also, being, verse 22, built up together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Look at verse 18. It tells us that each member of the Trinity is at work in saving the lost. For through him, God the Son, we both have access in one Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, to the Father, God the Father. All of the members of the Godhead are at work to save the lost. Now verse 22 says that all the members of the Godhead are at work to build the church. In him, God the Son, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God, God the Father, by God the Holy Spirit. In Christ, we are being built up, present tense. Right now, we're being built up. Uh, and it's in the passive. We're not doing the building. Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. He didn't say, I will build your church, and he didn't say, you'll build my church. He says, it's my church, and I'm the one doing the building. We are in the process of becoming what God has called us to be. Listen, there are no perfect churches. Good day, my name is HB, pastor teacher here at Shiloh Church. I hope you'll consider joining us as partners in the gospel for the glory of God. Your entire family will be blessed by being a part of the Shiloh Church, and we hope to see you there.